New Orleans Saints safety Tyron Matthew now one step closer to retiring with his childhood favorite team. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdet Nation and Houdet family? I am your host, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, New Orleans Saints expert, and your credentialed member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, we're going to be breaking down a heavily populated safety market. The New Orleans Saints picked the right time to get at least half of their safety search going. Michael Thomas, as we've expected all along, confirmed not going to be back in 2024. We'll break down all of the happenings around that. And of course, we're going to lead everything off here with Tyron Matthew, who is now one step closer to finishing his career with his hometown team, the New Orleans Saints, after agreeing to extend his contract for an additional year. We appreciate you very much as always. Make it Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. And for being an everyday you're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Saints is brought to you by friends over at Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use the promo code Locked On for $20 off of your first month. New Orleans Saints safety Tyron Matthew is now one step closer to doing what it is that he told us he wanted to do from the very moment of his introductory press conference, finish his career as a New Orleans Saint. Of course, Tyron Matthew, a New Orleans native, now sticking around for at least another season, uh, another season beyond planned uh, here in New Orleans. Tyron Matthew is entering the last year of his deal. Instead, He now has accepted and reworked his contract, which is effectively a two-year extension contracting him through 2025, so he'll be here this season and next for $13 million, which reduces his base salary in 2024 and saves him around five and a half million bucks. So if you're keeping tabs, that means that the Saints are only about three and a half million dollars remaining over the salary cap. They're going to be just fine. If you want to hear more about some of the salary cap moves that they can make, You can find that in yesterday's episode, but just as a quick refresher, Alvin Kamara, Ryan Ramchek, Demario Davis, and then of course Taysom Hill are all still options to have their salary caps redone and could get the New Orleans Saints between 20 to $30 million under the salary cap if they do all of those moves, which they may not. So we'll see exactly what happens there. But with Tyron Matthew, it does not at all, it is not at all lost on me that in the same day we get the official report that the New Orleans Saints will be moving on from Michael Thomas, which if you're an everydayer here on the show, you've known this since the combine, since before the combine, we've been talking about his contract and all these other things. We'll get to some of the 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 verbiage and some of the things around all of that in the next segment here. But what I want to highlight is that it's not lost on me at all that that news comes out and the same day the Saints are re-signing or reworking a deal to keep Tyron Matthew here in New Orleans. Tyron Matthew is the epitome of what it is that the New Orleans Saints feel that their culture should be. And I think that those two pieces of news dropping on the same day kind of support that, right? Kind of gives you the opportunity to really look and say, okay, this relationship isn't working. This relationship is working. What are the differences there? Now, you know, you can agree, disagree, all these other things. And the New Orleans Saints may not be intentionally trying to tell you that, but I think it always tells you something that players that the teams are willing to either move on from cut release or not have back or not, you know, have a new deal with or not work out a new deal versus the guys that they try to keep to stick around. I think that tells you a lot about who the team really values. And again, we can have our differences and opinions on that from the team, but I think it tells you a lot about what the team does and what the team thinks. I did, thanks to my good friend, John Butler, um, a, a really, you know, fun project that we do every year with a top 10 New Orleans Saints in the year before. Um, you can find that over at his uh, St. John Butler uh, YouTube page. And I had the option to pick who was the best player for the New Orleans Saints in 2024. And my selection without hesitation was Tyron Matthew. And I still believe that to this day, four interceptions, which tied with Paul Sinadibo at the top of that. But beyond just the interceptions and the on-field production, it was his leadership. Toward the end of the season, I spoke with Tyron Matthew and he told us about how he challenged the rest of the secondary to put the games on their back. And then they came out against Tampa and had a phenomenal game in Tampa with several takeaways. Jonathan Abrams stepping in at safety next to Tyron Matthew. The offense was aggressive. They had a lot of energy. And then they came back and then they helped to shut down the Atlanta Falcons the very next week. So it was a big part or he was a big part 
in kind of leading the charge of that sort of late season secondary resurgence that he felt that they needed, even though the secondary was probably the strongest part of this team and the most consistent part of this team all through the 2024 season. So I think that goes to show you a little bit about the leadership and about the expectations, the standards that a guy like Tyron Matthew brings with him and what it is that he brings to the rest of this team. And a big part of that is leading by example, but also being a vocal leader, right? We hear all the time about, oh, well, they're not a rah-rah guy or they're not a, a vocal leader. They're a lead by example guy. All of those things are excuses for not being a vocal leader. <laughs> Everything that we talk about, right? All we're doing is qualifying why they're not a vocal leader. Tyron Matthew is a vocal leader while also leading by example. And I do think that that late game season, you know, late season game push was a big part of kind of displaying that or putting that on full display. The other piece of it is that he spoke in his uh, press conference with us yesterday. He did like a Zoom call with us after the uh, the extension was announced. He talked about how like, look, he's really excited to be able to potentially finish out his career in New Orleans. But the other thing that he's really excited about is being able to impact the young guys now. Paul Adebo, Alante Taylor, Jordan Howden, whoever else they add. Isaac Yadam could potentially be back. Some of the other younger guys they could potentially bring in. Lonnie Johnson, Jonathan Abram could be back as well. There's a lot of these players that for Tyron Matthew, he sees as an opportunity to be able to help usher them into the star portion of their careers. And he wants to be a part of that. So you're bringing back not only a talented safety that has been consistent for you these two past seasons, but you're also bringing back a guy that you know took a big step forward in 2023 from 2022. He had a lot of tackling issues in 2022 that looked like they got cleaned up in 2023, was still taking the ball away, still producing at a high level on the field. But then you also get that leader that you need off on the sidelines. And that's something that we've known about the New Orleans Saints for some time is that post your breeze, it doesn't feel like they've ever really had that vocal leader, the guy that was the end all be all when it comes to this team. I don't think that Tyron Matthew puts himself in that category. That's oftentimes the quarterback's job. But I think that Tyron Matthew is maybe one of the closest that you get to that beyond Demario Davis and of course, Cameron Jordan as well. So I think this is a wise move for the New Orleans Saints, and it also puts them in a situation to where they can go into the safety market only needing one safety, and there's a lot of safeties that have become available, and in fact, the Saints even moved on from one themselves when they made the decision to move on from Marcus May. So while they moved on from Marcus May, who couldn't get out on the field, had tackling issues, wasn't producing as much as you hoped that he would, although he did have his flashes when he was healthy. It wasn't really the vocal leader, wasn't really that guy that anybody else talked about as being like, oh yeah, well, no, I got this from this guy or that from that guy. Juxtapose that with the guy that they just re-signed. Juxtapose that with the guy that they just reworked a deal for to keep for an extra year. Very, very different players. And so, and that's not to be disparaging to Marcus May. Everybody has their style of leadership. Everybody has their style of how they operate in the locker room, just like everybody has their style of how they operate on the field. That's not a, that's not a bad thing. It's just that you can see what it is that the New Orleans Saints value by looking at those two things juxtaposed from one another. So I think this is a fantastic signing. This is a fantastic uh, move by the New Orleans Saints. Not only does it help them salary cap wise, but it fulfills an opportunity to really do something for a guy that you cherish on this roster in Tyron Matthew. And you also end up finding a way to keep talent in the building in such a way that doesn't commit or push money down the road for a veteran guy. And I know that's something that a lot of folks have been concerned about. Will the New Orleans Saints continue to kick the can down the road on veteran players? Here was an interesting and unique way to be able to do not exactly that, but still end up save them, saving themselves some money, not only now, but also in the future. I mean, Tyron Matthew effectively just took less money in 2023 so that he would have an extended guaranteed contract going in for an additional year or 2024, sorry, an extended uh, additional contract going in for another year. And I like that trade off for the New Orleans Saints. Coming up next, one guy that will not be here in 2024, as we've been saying over and over again here on the show since the Senior Bowl, the Combine, all that, is Michael Thomas. But boy, the fireworks around the festivities sure were a lot to watch. We got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap, or not wrap up, but as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Well, Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost to every dollar that you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But to get this, get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is now even boosting every single dollar that you transfer in 
from another retirement account with a 3% match. That's right. And no cap on that 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. And of course, you can get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info, claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Uh, investing involves risk, including loss limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the first date of your first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% match Uh, matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. All right, family, the New Orleans Saints and Michael Thomas are headed to the um, expected split, but the fireworks around the festivities sure were a sight to behold. We appreciate you very much as always. Make it locked on Saints your first listen of the day. Every day, don't forget to go and check out the Locked On Sports Today National Sports 24-7 stream on YouTube, the first of its kind on YouTube. You can also find it on Amazon Fire TV apps as well, like the uh, Amazon, the free Amazon Fire channels apps. Make sure you go check it out uh, wherever you want over at Locked On Sports Today. All right, so um, boy, there was a lot going on when it came to this Michael Thomas situation, huh? So let, let's start off first with what all of this means. The New Orleans Saints are going to be in need of a possession receiver in 2024. Michael Thomas will not be back in 2024. uh, And the Saints kind of made the decision that we all expected them to to, to make. And this was kind of in play from the very beginning, from the moment that the Saints and Michael Thomas agreed on their rework deal last year. This always felt like it was going to be the reality. So I want to focus there first and just kind of explain what's going on with Michael Thomas and how this deal is getting done and what the appropriate language is around it. There was a big sort of tussle yesterday when this news broke around disagreement around verbiage. Uh, Is Michael Thomas being released? Is he being cut? Or is his contract simply voiding? It's really a little bit of both and at the same time, a little bit of neither. So let me see if I can explain this to you. So basically what happened, what happened was last year, the New Orleans Saints of Michael Thomas reached a new agreement that had a bunch of void years on it and did indeed have a 2024 year on it. But there was a condition in the contract that said that once Michael Thomas got to the first day of the league year in 2024, that the 2024 year would void and then he would be designated as a post June one cut. So that's why you hear verbiage like Michael Thomas is going to be released because procedurally, yes, he is going to be released in that he will be designated as a post June 1 cut. But for all intents and purposes, it was built into the contract as a fancy way for the contract to void. So really what Michael Thomas was on in 2023 contract wise was a one year deal with some hoops. That's the best way that I can explain it. And then there's some other sort of caveats to it as well. So if you release a player, for instance, before June 1, all of the dead money that's left on that contract, or even before the league year, however it is that you want to look at it, uh, all that dead money just rushes into your bookkeeping for the 2024 season. So all of the dead money that's on his deal would have ended up hitting the books for 2024. You can't have that happen if you're the New Orleans Saints. So that's why instead you have on the first day of the league year, the contract automatically designate him as a post-June 1 cut because then that ends up pushing dead money, deferring dead money down the road. The other thing is that on the third day of the league year, there was this big $119 million you know, amount that would have become guaranteed effectively as like a bonus. And you don't want that to happen because you ain't got it. Ended. Nobody got $119 million to give somebody on a bonus in one season, right? So that number was one of those like funny money numbers like we see with the uh, you know, the the Marshawn Lattimore contract from way back when that had a bunch of void years. And because he was being paid a certain amount over the course of four years, the void years technically had to have a number, you know, a, a monetary number assigned to it. And so you never want to do anything that's too low because then if you try to restructure into those void years, you can't go over what that number is. So usually they just pick like a $40 million number knowing that the player is not going to actually make the $40 million, but they don't want the roadblock should they try to extend that player into the void years. So that's a little bit about what, you know, contracts and dealing with all that and everything. And so that's that's a big part of why that $119 million number 
was attached there. It doesn't mean that the Saints took $119 million out of his pocket. He was never going to make that $119 million. The terms of the contract were either that his contract designated him as a post-June 1 cut on the first day of the league year, or that the contract had to be reworked, had to be renegotiated, and an extension had to be put in place. And so that would wipe out any of that you know, weird, funny money numbers and then end up creating actual numbers that just wouldn't have been able to exceed what those funny numbers were. That's why the funny numbers are so high, so that you can actually leave yourself the room to be able to negotiate. Oh, you had a really, really good 2023. We actually want to bring you back on a higher price point. We have the ceiling to be able to do that because we didn't cap ourselves with the funny money number in those void years. I I hope that that makes sense. So basically, the the things that you need to know from the contract standpoint is, Is Michael Thomas technically being released? Yes, procedurally, that is the case. However, really, it was just something that was already built into the deal. And so it's as if it were a one-year deal from the very beginning. Michael Thomas mentioned that. His agent mentioned that as well. And a lot of people took exception, Michael Thomas and his camp included. And, uh, you know, like I I, I get the a little bit of the like, the the sort of optics of it and things like that. You don't want to be seen as the player that they, you know, tore the contract up on or that you got cut or released or anything like that. But like procedurally, that's what's happening. The thing about it though is that it was a mutually agreed upon situation. It is not that the Saints were just like, oh yeah, well, you know, we're not bringing you back. You're done. And Michael Thomas was expecting to be back. I think everybody knew this was the end for the Michael Thomas era in New Orleans, which is really a shame because, and I know I talk about this often, but I want to make sure that I bring this up. It didn't have to end like this. If Michael Thomas isn't on the field on some meaningless third down in a fourth quarter game that's already put away back in 2020, maybe we're talking about the end of Michael Thomas's time in New Orleans very differently. Maybe we're not even talking about the end of Michael Thomas's time in New Orleans already here in 2024. So much has transpired since that moment. You know, needed surgery, wasn't able to get the surgery, didn't get the surgery, felt that he didn't need the surgery, however it is that you want to look at it, got ended up not being able to rehab from it, had to get surgery, got surgery, body rejected the surgery, missed the season. Okay, so then everything comes back and then he gets back on the field in 2022, not able to stay on the field there either, another injury ends up setting in, right? Early on in the season, three games in against the Carolina Panthers ends up getting shut down, thought that they might be able to rehab it. Nope, turns out not going to be able to rehab it. There you go, back in the same boat. And then 2023 gets the opportunity to be able to come out, plays through, you know, gets into the 10th game, gets, you know, has the injury against the Minnesota Vikings, and then isn't able to get back out on the field. And then now here's where we are. Imagine if 2020, the first game of that year, and by the way, he played through that injury, went on IR for the last three games of that season because they knew they were going to be in the playoffs and then came back for the playoffs, played in those playoff games. So just imagine if 2020, that first game, in a game where it's already put away, you're deep into the fourth quarter, you're running on third and six or whatever it was. Imagine if Michael Thomas isn't on the field. He's not out there. Imagine if Michael Thomas isn't out there to block and instead, you know, that's, a, a Traquan Smith or something like that, that hopefully doesn't get rolled up on the way that Michael Thomas did. But imagine if that's not Michael Thomas and how differently all of this ends up playing out. A guy that was coming off of an offensive re- re- offensive player of the year, uh, coming off of a you know record-setting year and all of those things. And I know that's not the Michael Thomas that people choose to remember. Like Even as I'm going through this, people are getting annoyed because I'm talking, I'm saying good things about what Michael Thomas could have been everything. And, and I understand, like, I get it. Like for the last four years, it's been tumultuous, but I like to believe that there's a world in which four years ago, if that doesn't happen, we're talking about this situation entirely differently here coming into 2024. But unfortunately, this is the reality that we're in. So Michael Thomas will not be in New Orleans Saint in 2024. That should be of no surprise to you, but just a little bit more detail into how that actually worked out and how that actually happened contractually. Coming up next, It's a very, very busy safety class all of a sudden across the NFL. Who are some players that could potentially fit for the New Orleans Saints who now have an open spot next to Tyron Matthew, who they're planning to bring back uh, for a while? we got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. 
Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by friends at Game Time, the fast and easy way to purchase tickets, whether you're booking them months in advance or if you're like me and you like booking stuff minutes in advance, you just want to be spontaneous. Maybe it's a spontaneous date night or something like that. And you decide you want to go and check out your favorite sports, music, comedy, theater, whatever it is near you, and you find it on the Game Time app, you can book it right away because they've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, none of that, the hidden stuff going on. You can see the view from your seat before you buy the tickets and best of all, their best price guarantee as well. So go check them out today. Download the Game Time app and take all the guesswork out of buying tickets. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use the promo code locked on for $20 off of your first month. Terms apply. Again, create an account and use the promo code locked on L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let's get it, Huda Nation. The New Orleans Saints might have picked the perfect season to get in on the safety market because something's going on with safeties around the NFL. We're going to discuss who are some of the good fits for the New Orleans Saints once they decide to move on or what now that they've decided rather to move on from Marcus May and why this is happening, why so many safeties are hitting the market. I have a theory. Appreciate you very much as always making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget we are your team every day. So make sure you come back on Monday where we'll have a fresh episode mock draft Monday. And don't forget, this is also the start of legal tampering as well. So we'll start to preview a little bit more getting into free agency, though I don't see the New Orleans States being super active during the 11th, 12th, and 13th, but who knows? They've surprised before. All right. So look, the new the, the NFL salary, uh salary, the NFL safety market uh is wild right now. Names like Justin Simmons from the Denver Broncos, Jordan Poyer from the Buffalo Bills. We've seen uh, guys like Xavier McKinney from, from the New York Giants and many, many others end up hitting the market. There is a long, long list of available free agent safeties all of a sudden that are just kind of out there. And in one exception, Kyle Duggar from the New England Patriots, who is though on a transition tag, meaning that he has the opportunity to go and negotiate with other teams, but the Patriots will get the opportunity to be able to match that contract uh, if should he agree to terms with another deal. So think about it like an RFA tender or something like that. So for the Saints who have made the decision to move on from Marcus May, who again only appeared in 17 uh, of the games over the past two seasons for a variety of different reasons, injury, suspension, this, that, and the other, wasn't super productive during his time in New Orleans either, not the way that they really expected from him. Um, they now have an opportunity here to maybe go out and grab a veteran safety to add to Tyron Matthew, who's now contracted through the 2025 season. Now, we know that there are players that are in-house or outgoing that could be good fits as well. The, you know, rookie safety Jordan Howden, who's going into his second year now, was outstanding last year. He can continue to to develop. Uh, you know, Jonathan Abram is a guy that we continue to highlight because I I just happen to know that the Saints really liked what he did those last two games uh, next to Tyron Matthew, and so there's a lot of good things that could potentially come from that. But now you have this big safety market that's all of a sudden overflowing. There's a couple of good fits there because I don't think that the reason that the safety market is now oversaturated is because safeties are all of a sudden bad universally across the NFL. It's just offenses are changing. So let's start off with some of the safeties that could potentially make sense. And yes, I'm going to start off with the big name here. I just mentioned that I don't think that the Saints are going to be big players in the first, second, third, you know, the first, we'll call it the first wave of free agency. I don't know where these safeties are going to fall with there being a relatively talented safety class in the draft with there being a very overpopulated safety class uh, in the open market, I don't know what that necessarily means for the safety market. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. Does that mean that because there's so many safeties on the market that those safeties wait to see what happens until after the draft before they start signing bigger contracts? Do they get big contracts because there's such an oversaturation of them? Is there a supply and demand issue for safeties where they come in underpaid this year? And we see the ebbs and flows of the safety position in this conversation over and over and over again. Think about years ago when like Kurt Coleman was getting good contracts and stuff like that. And then after that, like guys struggling to get contracts after that. So um, just looking at Justin Simmons, who could be a first wave guy, could be a second wave guy. We'll see exactly what the market demands or what the market says he's worth. Um, But boy, would he be a fit, right? Like it's pie in the sky. I get it. But just looking at sort of like the model of how he could fit somebody that can play as a split safety deep, somebody that can come down and play in the box as well. Like that's kind of what you're looking for here. You're not really looking for a single high safety right now. You're looking for somebody that can split the field with Tyron Matthew, 
and then while Tyron Matthews playing single high safety, that says that guy can come down and play in the box and be disruptive and be bothersome and be, you know, all of those other things that he needs to be. And Justin Simmons would absolutely fit that. Now, Justin Simmons also goes back pretty far with guys like Joe Woods, New Orleans Saints defensive coordinator, Marcus Robertson, New Orleans Saints defensive backs coach. Um, Justin Simmons was at the HBCU Legacy Bowl on the sideline. You know who was right next to him talking to him? Marcus Robinson, New Orleans Saints defensive line coach. So I'm not trying to get hopes up or say that, hey, this is a real possibility that New Orleans Saints would be there and things like that. It's going to completely depend upon what the market says Justin Simmons is worth. If Justin Simmons is worth top safety dollars, then the Saints will not be involved in that conversation. But if Justin Simmons ends up being in a situation where he's like, you know what? I don't care about the money. I don't want the money. I'm not trying to reset the market. I just want to be with people that I want to be with. I want to play in a place where I believe in myself and believe where we can do something then maybe New Orleans has enough personality and enough familiarity with Joe Woods, with Marcus Robertson to be able to offer him that. And maybe that ends up being very important to Justin Simmons. Unlikely, if we're being honest, but we'll see. But two guys that are hitting this free agency market that I think would be good fits for what it is that New Orleans needs is, and remember what we're looking for here. You're looking for a guy that can come down and play in the box, okay? Not necessarily looking for the, the single high safety. Guys like Xavier McKinney, who can do a little bit of everything, fantastic. Really, really good opportunity. Really, really good fit there. That could make a lot of sense too. But you're probably looking for a lesser contract. So that's where guys like Kyle Duggar, who's again on that transition tag, so things get a little bit tricky there because New England gets the opportunity to match. So you're literally in a bidding war. I can see the New Orleans Saints wanting to stay away from that because they want to set the terms of their deals. They're very specific about what their deals are. They're very precise about what their deals are. And so negotiating that again, negotiating their contracts against another team does not fit the MO of what it is that the New Orleans Saints do. But a guy like Jeremy Chin could. Now I've I've brought up Jeremy Chin's name and I've been met with the same thing over and over again. Well, he's he he can't cover. He's not a deep safety. Good. Fine. That's not what we're looking for. Just as a reminder. We're looking for a guy that might be able to split the field with Tyron Matthew. You're looking for a guy that's going to be able to play in the box. And one guy that can play in the box incredibly athletically is a Jeremy Chin. Jeremy Chin, if used the right way and put in the right situations, could be akin to Isaiah Simmons if somebody would have ever put him in a defensive back room, if somebody would have ever had him play at safety as opposed to play at linebacker over in Arizona. Like that would have made such a big difference for, for, uh, for Isaiah Simmons. That's something that can make a big difference for Jeremy Chin. Jeremy Chin was put away from the line of scrimmage too much in Carolina, way too much in Carolina. In New Orleans, he wouldn't have to do that. He can just be hyper-athletic, fast as all get out, and go out there and make some plays, playing with his head on fire. And that's not a bad situation to be in. Now, the Saints might say, you know what, we don't need to go to the veteran market because we like the guys that are in-house, the guys that are outgoing that they want to bring back. They might like some guys in the in the the draft uh, area and everything like that. So they might be totally fine. But a guy like Jeremy Chin to me could be really, really exciting if he's used properly. And I would trust a guy like Marcus Robertson to be able to hone out the sort of corner where a guy like Jeremy Chin can be hyper productive in, uh, in, in the right system. So why is the safety market like this? Should we be concerned at all about the Saints signing safeties because apparently they're all bad? No, no, no. It's not that. What's happening with the safety market right now is that this is the ebb and flow of the NFL. NFL offenses ha- are now adop- adapting based upon what it is that NFL defenses are doing or, or vice versa. So NFL defenses are adapting to the fact that NFL offenses want to air the ball out. They want to play the wide zone situation. They want to air the ball downfield. They want to be able to take big shots, all these other things. So now you're seeing a lot of, instead of single high safeties, you're seeing a lot of split safety looks, you're seeing a lot of two high safety looks. And what that does is that it takes away the deep ball right away and says, okay, you got to either beat us by nickeling and diming us down the field, or you got to be able to run the ball. So that's diminished. So what's happening now is that as that's happening, these guys that are the single high safeties that used to be the hardest thing to find in the NFL, they're now all of a sudden less valuable. That's why you're seeing guys like Justin Simmons hit the market, right? And so these coverage safeties are getting a little bit easier to find because they're splitting responsibilities as opposed to being the lone center fielder, like a Marcus Williams, for instance. And so that position now has less value than it did before. And now what you're looking for is a pair of safeties as opposed to a safety and a guy to play down in the box. So I think that that's a big piece of what's happening here. And I think that that will change because what's going to happen is that as the NFL defenses start doing more too high and doing more cover two and saying, we dare you to run the ball. NFL offenses are going to say, all right, bet. And they're going to start putting two safety or two tight ends out there. They're going to end up going back to the old eye formation with a lead blocker and a tailback, and they're going to run it up the gut. 
And that's what they're going to continue to do to be able to do this. And then what you're going to see is that those box safeties are going to get more expensive. You're going to see more single high safety up top, more safeties coming down to load the box. And then NFL offenses are going to go right back to taking advantage of that and airing it down the field. And that thus is the rhythm of the NFL. And that's one of the reasons why I love this game so much is the ever-changing landscape and the ever-changing chess match that is the NFL. All right. We appreciate you very much, as always, for being here and making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out Locked on Pels with my good friend Jake Madison, Locked on LSU with my good friend Caroline Fenton, bringing you everything you need to know about the LSU Tigers and the New Orleans Pelicans. We appreciate you very much, as always, making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media. At Ross Jackson, N O L A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.